Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Necroxus and we're going to continue our look at the Lorewalkers. That is the name of the faction that Lorewalker Cho is a part of. We're going to take a look at the Lorewalker stories for the enemies of Pandaria. This is the second part. The first video, which was released a few days ago, was about the Hosen, the Jinyu. How does today find you? And the Sarok. So we're going to look at the Mogu, the Mantid, and the Yongol today. I think I'm going to do the Yongol first because they are the least important. I don't want to say least important. They're the least dangerous of the of the three enemies, I, I suppose. So let's begin. Farewell. Fire. It is the most magical of elements. It warms us. It cooks our food. It is the hearth fire that makes a house a home. In the right hands. Fire can shape iron into sword. Fire is the instrument of change. That was weird. Cut off there. Long ago, a group of sturdy nomad hunters wandered the world. By a stroke of fate, they were here in Pandaria when the Sundering split apart the continents of Azeroth. The wanderers found themselves trapped in the town Long Steps, a harsh and dangerous land. Those noble hunters found a way to survive on their own. Fire was the key. They drew up oil from the ground. They used it to heat their homes, cook their food, and burn their enemies. They grew strong. From the flames of fate, the young goal were born. They survived beyond the wall. For they refuse to submit to any law but their own. Has fate been cruel to the young goal? You may as well ask if fire is good or bad. Fate is like fire. It can shape us, or it can destroy us. All that matters is what you do with it. So yeah, the young goal were once torn, if you haven't figured that out yet. I would have thought the comparison is pretty obvious, although just thinking about it from a biological standpoint, are yaks related to cows? I don't think they actually are, but you know, I guess we can just explain that away as bibbidi bobbidi boo magic on Azeroth. <laughs> but as I was listening to that, I was a little sad that the Yongol are such bland villains in this expansion. Because if you weren't paying attention or if you don't uh, connect the dots, you actually won't even realize why the Yongol are doing what they're doing. They are in Kunlai Summit, about right here, around this area, and they're invading. And Town Long Steps, this whole part right here, is about them. But after that, they are basically done as a villain in this expansion. And it's not until you actually do the Dread Wastes and complete the entire Mantid storyline that you understand that the Yongol are only doing what they're doing because the Shah of Fear took control of the Mantid and is making the Mantid go crazy. Like, that's the whole story behind the Mantid. If, spoiler alert for those who haven't done it yet. The Shah of Fear took control of the Queen and is making her do crazy stuff and making the Mantid go nuts a hundred years earlier than they usually do on their own, naturally. So the Mantid going crazy has forced the Yongol from their homes and they're just trying to escape. But because they're a warlike race and that's how they evolved, they don't know how to do it any other way except to just invade into Kunlai Summit and just fight the Pandaren. And the Shadow Pan are just like, oh shit, and they're just killing them left and right. Which is really sad if you think about it. They're not actually enemies to the, Panda the Pandaren. They're just trying to get away from the Mantid. And you don't, like I said, you don't really get that unless you take in the whole story as it's going along. Because I remember when I first realized that as I was learning about the Shah. Because you, you learn about the Shah through the whole expansion. But when you learn about the Shah of Fear, and how the Shah of Fear is basically the boss, the, the final boss of 5.0. Because oh, Blizzard, their whole shtick with this expansion is... Well, there's not a final boss, even though there kind of is in Garage, but we have patch bosses instead, like Vanilla. Like, for 5.0, the patch boss is the Shah of Fear. He is the Shah, or it is the Shah that has done basically everything 
that is making Pandera, Pandaria shitty. It's, it's commanding the Mantid to invade early, which is what's causing all the problems in, in the Valley of the Four Winds and the Crash Rang Wilds. Um, the Mantid are then causing the Yongol to go crazy, which is what's going on in uh, Town Long Steps and Kunlai Summit. And even Jade Forest um, has to do with the Shah and the Mogu connection. So, like I said, the, the Yangol, I wish they would have explored them more instead of just all just all, us just killing them off. Because, I mean, at the end of the story, you basically just murder them all. I mean, I'm sure there's some that survive somewhere. But I severely doubt we're ever going to see them again in any capacity, which is it's a shame. Because I think they have the potential to be interesting villains. Alright, let's move on to the Mantid. Jade Serpent guide you. Oh, my student. You wish to study the Mantid? Ah, be warned. The Pandaran frontier is littered with the graves of former pupils. The Mantid are harsh Oops. teachers. Every generation, the Mantid swarm the Serpent's spine wall in great numbers. This is what they I was murder talking about. many Pandaran. So we kill many times their number in return. Yet each generation, they attack once more. Why do they do this? We Pandaren do not know. Our ancient writings indicate that the Mantid have always been here. They predate even the Mogu. Where did they come from? We Pandaren do not know. But I do. Perhaps if you were to befriend the Mantid and earn a reputation among them, they would teach you their secrets. But I warn you, nobody has ever befriended the Mantid. Here is what the Pandaren do know. By massacring our people, by slaughtering tens of thousands of Pandaren, generation after generation, they have taught us the value of life. A precious but fleeting gift, easily snuffed out in an instant. This is what the Mantid have taught us. So, let's, 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 have, let's have a little dialogue. The reason that the Mantid do what they do, and by the way, he didn't say it, but every generation is every 100 years, the Mantid swarm, which is when all of the newly born or infant Mantid attack the rest of Pandaria. And that is why the Mogu, when they were in control, built this very long wall that you've seen throughout the whole expansion called the Serpent Spine. Oops, sorry. The Serpent Spine. And the reason they do this is because um, Mantid, when they're young, they're basically like ravenous beasts. They can, can't really be controlled. They can just kind of be aimed to certain areas. And that is what the Elder Mantid do. And the reason they do this is to not only whittle down their numbers, but the ones that survive the swarming come back and they are the, like the veterans, like they're the new generation of veterans. Like how every, you know, just a real world example, as elder soldiers grow up and die, the ones that are the most impressive and are younger move on to become the next generation of the elder ones. That's basically what happens with the Mantid. Um, so they do this because they're young or crazy and they just direct them towards the Pandaren and um, yeah, so basically that's the story of the Mantid. And like I was talking about earlier, this all gets screwed up because the Shah of Fear takes control of the Queen and makes the Mantid uh, swarm early. I don't remember how many years early they're actually swarming. I think it's like 20. It's like 20 years earlier than they usually do, which is why the Pandaren are caught off guard because they have got it down to a science too. Both the Pandaren and the Mantid realize it's every 100 years. So as the Mantid are, sw are uh, swarming 20 years earlier, or however long it is, they're caught off guard. That's why there's a whole shit going down in all the zones that I just listed earlier. So that's the Mantid. Um, another interesting piece of information is that the Mantid who don't have wings are the veterans, or the, the battle-hardened Mantid. Because I know in some quests you see Mantid just flying over the wall. And I have had people ask me on both Buttwaithers lore and just curious about the lore, how come they all just don't fly over the wall? Like, what's the point of the wall? And why would the Mogu make the wall if the Mantic could just fly? It's because the most strongest 
and the best equipped mantid can't actually fly anymore. They've lost their wings. In addition to the mantid using those beasts, uh, the Kuchong, let me see if I could find... You know what they look like, but I just want to show you. Oh, that's not it. Wrong one. I'm looking for... Here we go. These things. The Kuchong. So yeah, that's the mantid. The mantid are actually incredibly fascinating in my opinion. Like Lorewalker Cho hit on, they've existed on Pandaria since before humans and uh, the orcs and basically almost every other race has existed. And they willingly serve the old gods, which is what you find out from the Klaxi. They're not like mind controlled or they're not like some created race like the other ones like the Silithid are or you know the faceless ones are created or directly under control of Cthulhu and yogg -Saron. The Manta just willingly serve Yasiraj, which is their old god. So I really like them. Although at this point they have kind of been used to capacity. If they kept using the Manta as an enemy, I think it would go overboard. It would be nice to see them come back if Yasiraj is resurrected. Um, especially if the Kalaxi, who were once our, our allies, became our enemies. Like the Zandalari were. But I think the Kalaxi would make more sense because they explained it well enough. Like the Zandalari, when they were first our allies, and then just suddenly just completely switched to our enemies. A lot of people, including myself, were like, what, what the hell happened? But I think the Kalaxi would make sense. So, with that, let's Bandaria welcomes go to the final uh, villainous race. At least in this video, the Mogu. Let's begin. Tread lightly. What do you fear most in this world? Have you conquered your fear? Or has your fear conquered you? In the ancient days before the sundering of the world, the Mogu emperors ruled over Pandaria. My people were made slaves, and they were afraid. The Mogul were masters of pain and torture, of dark magics and brutal weapons. No Pandaren, Hosen, or Jinyu could resist the power they held. And my people were afraid. It was the Mogul who built the Serpent Spine. The most unlucky of slaves were sent to aid in its construction and defense, to be fodder for the Mantid. And my people were afraid. As the Empire grew, the Mogul began to experiment with the secrets of the Vale. They crafted terrible weapons of living flesh and stone. And my people were afraid. In their hubris, the Mogul never foresaw that their downfall lay in wait. Not among their enemies, but among the oppressed. The day that one slave stood and was no longer afraid. I wonder if that guy has a name in the lore, because I don't definitely know what it is. The first Pandaren that stood up against the Mogu, and that's the whole story of how monks became a thing, like in, in, in Warcraft's lore. The Pandaren trained themselves to fight against the Mogu because the Mogu obviously didn't give them weapons. And that's where the idea of monks came from. So yeah, there's not really much more I can add on to that that you guys all probably already know about the Mogu. So that's it. That's the end of this second video. Thanks for watching everybody. My name is Necroxus and look for the final video where we talk about the burdens of Shao Hao, which will be connecting to 5.3 and beyond. I know this for a fact. So. If you don't know about him yet, uh, stay tuned to the next video, which will be very interesting, as well as some other topics, such, uh, such as Liu Lang and the gigantic turtle of the Wandering Isle. If you don't know his story yet, he will be next, too. So thanks again, guys. This is another look at Warcraft lore. And continue to watch, because there's always more lore to explore. Farewell.